Good, good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order for the City of Geneva Historic Preservation Commission on Tuesday, August 21st. Hamilton? Here. Hiller? Aye. Here, sorry. Solomon? Voting in Aye. favor. Stason? Here. Delmar? Aye. Here. Um, Mr. Stazen, you're new to our commission. Would you like to say a few words about uh, living in Geneva and serving your expectations for serving on the commission? Well, uh, expectations, I, I don't know if I really have any other than I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, and I hope that uh, my, my, all my years as an architect and background can certainly contribute something to this commission uh, and to the city of Geneva. We've been 20 year residents and just absolutely love it like everybody else. And I'd like to help out as much as possible. Great, well, welcome to the commission. Thank you. Um, our first item of business is the uh, approval of the meeting minutes for July 17th, 2018. Does anyone have any comments? No, no, I don't. Can I get a um, motion to approve them then? Motion to approve. Minutes as presented and noted. Second. Second. Okay. Um, in favor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Any... Mr. Chairman, I believe I should abstain since sure. I wasn't here last time. Very good. <clears throat> okay. Uh, meeting minutes are approved. Okay, our next item on the agenda is a five minute field guide from Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Chairman Zellmer. Um, as you know, we have implemented these educational sessions at the beginning of our meeting called Five Minute Field Guides. And uh, this month's segment is on historic wood siding. Uh, as all of you know, wood siding is one of the most common historic building materials. Um, horizontal wood siding um, is probably the most uh, uh, common wood siding, but it is milled in a variety of profiles. And many of those profiles are a direct result of sawing capabilities during their period of significance, as well as specific building techniques. Lap siding, or clabbered, is a squared siding and typically found on pre-20th century buildings. It does not have a bevel. It is strictly a square board. Um, it is a thicker material, which makes it often more difficult to lay up and nail without cracking. Um, however, it was very easy to produce uh, with primitive sawing equipment. Bevel siding um, was the next technological uh, evolution, and it is a tapered material resulting in a tighter building envelope. The thinner board um, at the top made for easier nailing and uh, resulted in less splitting of the boards. Dolly Varden siding is a solid wedge siding that interlocks with a rabbit joint, that interlocking joint that you see at the bottom and top of the siding. Um, the advantage of Dolly Varden's siding, even though it's um, material um, heavy, is that it's extremely weather tight and it's extremely stable on the side of a, of a building. Shiplap or butt joint siding is also very weather tight and stable. It gets its name from coming from ship, ship building. Um, where it was used to create watertight hulls. Um, the effect of shiplap siding is that it creates a smooth, flat wall finish, and in the early Greek Revival period and the federal style that preceded it, it was often painted with sanded paint, so it uh, imitated uh, stone construction. Uh, uh, shiplap siding was uh, often used for public and religious buildings where a more uh, uh, elaborate building was re um, pre preferred. <coughs> Dutch lap siding is often confused with ship lap siding, but the characteristic uh, detail of Dutch lap siding is it has a curved depression at the top of the siding board. It may or may not have an interlocking joint, but does have an overlapping joint, which results in a very weather tight and stable installation as well. Drop channel siding is similar to Dutch lap uh, siding, except that it has a square reveal rather than a curved recess. The design of the reveal varies, um, or the design of the siding um, on a building uh, varies by the size of the reveal. The reveal can be very narrow, it can be very wide. And architects of different periods exploited that reveal for a particular architectural emphasis. 
Car siding, or V-groove siding, evolved from the construction of railroad and streetcars. The rabbited joints mimic the center V-groove, so when it's laid up, it looks like a series of individual boards, even though there's two boards to, or two uh, sections to each board. Again, this is a very strong material, and it's also a weather-tight material. <clears throat> uh, beyond the uh, traditional uh, wood sidings, there was a series of novelty wood horizontal signs that were introduced throughout the 19th and 20th century. Uh, one of those is log cabin siding, which produces the look of log construction without utilizing entire logs. It's a more efficient use of material and more weather tight than chinked logs that required the chinking or the mud daubing to be replaced on a regular basis. Wavy siding is reminiscent of pre-American revolutionary buildings. The siding does not waste material by creating a straight edge on the bottom of the siding material. It was popularized in America during the 1920s and 1930s as America experimented with the Tudor revival in residential and commercial architecture. Vertical wood sign has been considered an inexpensive utilitarian sign that was easy to install over timber frame structures and was used in many utilitarian buildings. <coughs> Residentially, it has been popularized for seasonal beach cottages and other um, seasonal types of buildings. But in recent years, it has gained widespread favor for contemporary residences, um, but it is only somewhat weather tight in its actual construction. The way we use it today, it's put over building wraps so it's a tighter construction, and it's made tight by the batten or the small thin strip that is put over the joint. Similar to um, board and batten is vertical plank that was used for primitive utilitarian buildings. It's not as weather tight, but it did provide protection. And curiously, we have at least one building in the historic district that has a small portion of the building built with vertical siding, and that stands at 212 South 5th Street. You may remember that as the Merritt King House, and it evolved over time, and the original 10 by 10 cell was made of vertical plank. True reverse board and batten is really a vertical use of the uh, drop channel siding that we saw earlier. However, since the 1950s, reverse board and batten siding is available in a sheet plywood form known as T111. Wood shingle siding became popular in the last quarter of the 19th century as a way to provide variation and, and, and depth of shadow on uh, late Victorian era architecture. Shingles were laid up in many different patterns. Um, they could be coarsed or straight-edged, diamond, sawtooth, dog-eared, fish scale, irregular or ragged, or a combination of any of those. Dog-eared or ragged is uh, like the, uh, the center portion here, um, where it is, is irregular coursing, <coughs> or apparently irregular coursing. As the 19th century wore on and, and uh, architecture became more exuberant, the thatch shingle siding became uh, more popular. It was a free form and very labor intensive type of siding and used an uh, extreme amount of material to create the various patterns, shapes, and depths of the siding. Um, to achieve some of the forms that were used in, the, uh, in this type of shingle siding, it was required to use steam to bend the shingles and uh, a variety of saws to cut the waves and the intricate patterns. With the arts and crafts style, shingle siding emphasized clean straight lines and often created visual interest with the patterns of the coursing, as you can see in the upper image here, where the, the uh, shingles are spaced with a small reveal and then a wide reveal and then a small reveal. Um, if you look at arts and crafts buildings from uh, uh, throughout the period, you'll see that architects play with variations on the spacing of the shingle siding. By the early 1960s and early 1970s, sandblasted cedar shingles with deep graining became popular, as shown in the lower image here. In the mid-20th century, fiber cement shingles guaranteed for a lifetime mi mimicked wood shingles and were popular due to their durability and their fire resistance made possible with the use of asbestos. 
Today, an asbestos-free version is available to create the same look with either straight-edged or coarsed um, shingles or wave or even a thatched or ragged edge shingle. This is a brief overview of wood siding in American architecture and concludes this month's five-minute field guide. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next item is a uh, public hearing. And uh, just to remind the commission, we need to open it, and then we'll, and then we'll hear public comment. Then we'll close the public comment period. We'll hopefully get a motion, and then we'll discuss the motion, and then we'll vote on that motion. Uh, can I get someone to open the public hearing? No, I'll move to uh, open public hearing on 101 North 1st Street for the uh, garage demolition. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Voice vote. All in favor say hi. 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 Any, uh, any dissent? No. Okay. Public hearing is open. Mr. Lambert. Good evening, Commission. Um, this project at 101 North uh, 1st Street is located in the North Geneva Historic District, which is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and is found in the northeast corner of the local Geneva Historic District. The property is coming forward to you today because it is a significant property, and per our Historic Preservation Ordinance, demolitions um, involving a significant property need to come before this commission. The uh, garage that's in question was built sometime between 1912 and 1923, most likely for John Wells and Edith McJunkin. Um, the 1912 Sanborn map shows a two-story carriage barn that uh, traversed the property line at the rear of the property. And by 1923, you can see the garage that stands today um, replaced that carriage barn and was moved uh, slightly to the west uh, to be wholly on the McJunkin property. Before you, um, in your packet, and what was disseminated to the public, is a history of the evolution of the property. Um, we are not looking at the house. The only issue that's under consideration for this public hearing is the garage. Um, just some views, and I'll let the uh, petitioner explain more about the condition of the garage and, and why it's coming forward as a demolition. But some existing conditions, uh, you can see the driveway is in poor shape. It hasn't been used for some time. And then the uh, west elevation of the garage the south elevations of the garage, which you can see, are compromised by volunteer trees. Um, some details of the condition of the trees growing out in under the foundation. Um, the, um, again, the windows, uh, window on the south side, uh, you can see the condition of that, and again, the volunteer tree. And then uh, the condition of the um, uh, the, the northwest corner of the garage um, facing 1st Street. The little piece of material you see hanging over the fascia is actually what's left of the tarp that was put on years ago to uh, uh, keep the building weather tight. But water has infiltrated not only the roof structure but also the walls, um, which are, again, uh, being infiltrated by water from above, <coughs> vines from the exterior, and volunteer trees from below. Um, again, the uh, North side of the um, existing garage as it stands today, you can see the, uh, again, the volunteer tree and the edge of the tarp and the neighboring garage. Um, you can also see the vines that have grown um, along the, the, the building. Um, again, another view of the north side um, with the north window and the siding um, going towards the back. And with that, that is the uh, conditions. You've got a full report of what's been submitted. Uh, to the uh, in, in request for the demolition and just to report to the commission that the um, the case was properly noticed to the neighbors um, and was also published um, as required for uh, general public release. So with that, I'd like to turn over the podium over to Jim Coleman. There he is. And you can add to it and answer any other questions. My name is Jim Coleman. I uh, own Coleman Management Company, and I'm here on behalf of Joe Aiken, the property owner. I've uh, managed this property for about five or six years, and we were contacted recently by the City of Geneva saying that we should either improve it or tear it down. We chose that it's in such bad shape that we think it would be better if we tore it down. 
so we went through the process of notifying there was like three condominium buildings within 500 feet so we filled out a lot of a lot of envelopes and uh, um, so I'm here today to ask you for permission to go ahead and tear it down we've got uh, uh, an estimate that we will accept from Franz landscape or Franz demolition to tear it down Questions for the petitioner? I guess one question I had in the material, there was a, an email, I believe, that had an estimate of the cost to uh, re refurbish it. Re refurbish, re renovate. Renovate. Where did that come from? I think you and I kind of looked up some building codes and, uh, and building um, estimation um, data, and uh, it was kind of a I guess. So it wasn't someone that actually went out and assessed the condition and what it would take to renovate? Uh, no, the condition is obvious when you look at it. It's just a really, 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 really bad condition. You know, I think that number kind of jumped out at me, too. I mean, it almost looks like a number for new construction rather than a garage, um, I mean, per square foot. Um, but that neither here nor there um, I had one question too I don't know if this is for you or for staff uh, when did the uh, code enforcement uh, bring the condition of the building to anyone's attention in either the city or to the petitioner I think it was about four months ago wasn't it that uh, you'd contacted Joe Aiken and, and said do you want something you want to have the it fixed or torn down I didn't bring that date with me, but I want to say it was actually longer than that. I think it was last fall that uh, the first notice went out from code enforcement, and I believe that I met with Mr. Coleman, I think, in March, if I remember correctly. Okay, so it's been less than a year that it's been corrected. <clears throat> I guess you said You've been managing the property for five years? Approximately, yes. Approximately. And the owner has owned it for? Um, 30, 40 years, I would guess. I guess, why, why wasn't something done before it got to this point? Um, neglect on the part of the, uh, the owner. Um, and. Uh, took the, a little nudge from the city of Geneva to say let's get it taken care of which I appreciate yeah I, I looked at the um, unless there's any other comments from I looked at the, the cost estimates and they looked a little high especially since there's no mechanicals or anything like that in this space but I also looked at the condition of <laughs> It's visible from the picture. So, any other questions from the commission? Okay. May I just correct? Not correct, but just for the record, the question about how long the property has been owned by Mr. Aiken. He bought it in 1998. 98. Per, per, per the information here. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any questions from the public, or comments from the public? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to get a, can I get a motion from someone to close the public hearing? Move to close public uh, hearing on 101 North 1st Street. A second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Okay, the public hearing is closed. I, at this point, we would entertain a motion to um, to act on his request for a demolition. So does anyone want to put together a motion to do that? We have discussion first. I think we have it after the, go ahead. You can discuss what you've had, but if you want to discuss it as a motion, you have to have the motion on the floor and second to discuss the motion. Um, and then there's no vote taken on the motion. There would be a vote taken there, on the motion when you're ready, when you're ready to take the, a vote. So you, you would, so would we move to open discussion or would we move to demo, uh, approve? 
you don't need to move to open discussion. You, you're, you're moving in that phase. You just need to, if, you, if there's a motion that some uh, commissioner wants to make in regards to the request, that should be made. And then if that's second, then you should have the discussion on, the, on that motion. Debate the merits, whatever you want to do. Is there anyone that wants to put together a motion to? Uh, I guess we can, you know, motion for 101 North First Street to accept proposal for demolition of the garage due to deterioration. Can I get a second on that? Sure, I'll second. Okay, now we can discuss it. Mr. Hiller, do you have some <laughs> comments you'd like to make? Not, not a lot, but you know, okay. I, I, I noted in in the paperwork that IHPA was uh, somewhat critical of us for uh, handling garages and outbuildings and things like that, and uh, it seems that uh, we are somewhat at fault here too because it seems to me that uh, code enforcement probably should have notified the city sooner because it seems that the petitioner seemed to have been somewhat willing to do something had, had it not gone this far. Yes, actually when Mr. Aiken first came to me after he got the letter, he was trying to find a way to rehab it. Um, and uh, um, that's when he had um, Mr. Coleman kind of step in because it was kind of way beyond what he was expecting it to be. Um, and kind of in reference to the testimony that was made about uh, cost estimates, we actually looked at a couple other garages that have been are being proposed to be rehabbed in the district and what their numbers were. And I don't think the numbers were that far off based on what's happening in that building. Um, there is hardly a roof structure left. Um, the trees are growing under the foundation um, and the walls are saturated from both the top and from the bottom from the vine in infiltration. So, um, uh, so after looking at all those factors with Mr. Aiken, um, then it was kind of determined that it's probably way beyond um, salvage at this point, but it, it, it has gone several years uh, before it finally was uh, noted by code enforcement. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously it's been a lot of years neglect. I mean, that took a long time for it to get to that fragile condition. Right, and, and as far as the IHPA comment as well, just so that, just to remind you and so the public knows, um, with the survey update that is ongoing, um, and I'll update you more on that in the secretary's report, but one of the things we are looking at is actually surveying all of the garages. Um, I did not do a comparative of other similar garages um, like I've done on, in some of the ones in the past. Um, um, but there are, there are a number of early 20th century garages still standing in the historic district. So this isn't the only example of an early 20th century garage in the district? Correct, it's not the only, it's not the last. I have a garage on my property that was built in 1907. Um, and when I was given a permit for my new garage, I had the option. I probably could have torn it down then, but I chose not to. Um, we did a roof, siding up to the windows, replaced some windows. Uh, the sill plate had carpenter ants uh, and did a lot of res restoration work on it, um, but nowhere near the cost of of this project, and I, I, that's why I questioned it. I mean, for the cost of the demolition, we could almost have done the repair. I, again, I think one of the mitigating factors is the volunteer trees. There's three of them that I can I could get to to look at um, that are growing under the building. I could not get to the east. The one reason you did not see the east elevation because we were supposed to have all elevations. We couldn't get to it with the uh, trees that are growing. So it it is it is, it is a long term process here are, are we concerned about setting a precedent of ne demolition by neglect any comments from there what, what was the comment again <clears throat> that we're setting a precedent that there's demolition by neglect, and if you let it go long enough, you're going to be able to tear it down. That's that's a big part of what concerns me is um, ignoring and not maintaining over the years and watching it deteriorate. It's going to get anything's going to get to the point where it's mm -hmm. 
too expensive to try to repair. Yeah. Part, I think, would fall back on the city to notify them or to at least advise them sooner, but I, 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 I'm still struggling with allowing neglect to be a reason for demolition. I, I will say on behalf of the city that our, our, I do work close with the code enforcement officer and numerous letters go out every week um, trying to track this down. I do believe conversation has been going on for years before this was cited, but I, I, I can't verify that. But I do believe that um, code enforcement has been uh, pursuing this, but it became aggressive last fall. I mean, I, I would almost like to see a legitimate estimate, a legitimate evaluation of, of what it truly would take yeah. to, we, we could, to renovate. We could table it to, to get that estimate if you feel it's important. I mean, I don't, It's going to be more than demolition, no matter what. Obviously, sure. I, I, I guess the question I would ask, ask the commission as you're considering that question is, I don't know how many of you went and looked at the property from the street or up close. I don't know if you did, um, but the question would be: Is it going to end up being more of a reconstruction than a restoration? And so you also want to put that in your thought process as far as what precedents you're setting as well. Um, because there's always people who want to re rebuild things like they looked, um, and we've heard that before here. So, in the case of false historicism, but that right. fits better into the standards, uh, pres uh, Secretary of Interior standards of replacing in like or kind rather than demolition. It's it's a stronger argument for the standards. I, I have a question. Uh, is, is the consideration to replace this particular structure? I don't believe so. Just, just a demolition. Yeah. Yeah. It's just demolition. a demolition. The, the, the house is divided into apartments, um, and, um, and none of the tenants use the, um, use the um, garage or have any interest in using the garage either for storage or for automobile use. So um, there's no interest in rebuilding another garage for a tenant or multiple tenants. And our concern really isn't if we're looking at demolition, we don't really look at what would be replaced. It's just, just pure demolition. So, going, going back to the discussion just a second ago, are, were we saying that it was deemed irreparable, or, or there, there's, there is not a statement or an estimate from a licensed contractor saying it's not reparable. However, again, um, I'm working with two other people right now on garages, um, restoring them that are in um, significantly better shape, I would say, than, than this particular garage. Um, and they are, they're really struggling with whether it's, they're on the brink of saving those two garages. So, I mean, it's... I think you can go through the exercise if, if that's the request of the commission to have it more formalized and, and, and looked at. But I, um, just by the inherent nature of the way the garages are built, one of the things you can't see um, from the uh, exterior is at some point that w the rear wall between the main garage and the lean-to was partially cut out, obviously to allow for a car to extend further into the garage. Um, and so you're dealing with basically a box that has two ends of it opened um, and then has no roof to tie it together. So um, uh, again, it's, it's an unfortunate situation here, but I just don't want to mislead you because I have had the opportunity to go into the, into the building that you haven't had. And um, it's, it would be hard to tie it together, I think, mm -hmm. to, to try have, to lift have, and repair the foundation or whatever. Sorry. Well, that makes sense. Have the other two garages that you referenced had estimates to have their work redone, the renovation work. They have them. I have but not seen. I have not seen them, but I know that the the one um, came in a lot more than was expected, and so they're considering coming in for a demolition on that one as well. Would it have to do with lead paint at all, or was no, it? No, it's just 
deferred the, deferred maintenance again. Deferred maintenance. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm kind of torn with this. I think the severity, the de deterioration is is there. I mean, it's one of those things that you can't save everything. And I, 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 I like the garage. I mean, I like it. If it, was, if it were mine, I would do something with it. But I, I you know, I, I, I understand that you can't, you can't make someone do, you know, rebuild a, uh, basically rebuild it in, in, in the, in its own form. And I, th I think I'm in the same place. You can't undo what time has done, and we can't go backwards. Mm -hmm. And if, if 63,000 is a realistic number to rehab it, I, I think that's probably unreasonable. I and I would, I would probably lean towards okay in the demolition. I would prefer it be renovated, but Absolutely. I, I think that's almost undue. Yeah, I think that number if it is the correct number is 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 a is a little bit steep for and replacement i think I, what was the replacement number that was in the packet i believe it was um, the sixty three thousand no, dollars no fifty five or fifty five fifty five which i i thought it was about thirty five but even at that it's more than even at half it's a tough not to, tough yeah line. even at thirty it would be a tough not to well, again, one of the things that is driving that cost up also is this is on a hillside, so it's not a slab on grade either. It's it's a, it's a full footing that would have to go back under to be, meet the building code, mm -hmm. and, and it's a stepped footing. So I mean, there's it's, if it was a slab on grade, the concrete would be a lot less. It could be a floating slab, but that's not the condition here. Mm -hmm. Are we uh, done with discussion? Do you does anyone do you want to vote on this? Are we are I mean, I'm of, this, of the same nature. It's like, you know, you don't want to see any, you know, set a precedent for letting something just, you know, rot and then be able to do away with it. But I think at this point in the game, especially the way the, obviously the, the, the trees have made issues with the foundation and it's, you know, it's, at this point there's no sense in delaying the inevitable, inevitable, so to say. Chairman Zellmer, the commission does have the option if you wanted to modify the motion to include a proviso of, of why you're okay. taking the action you take. You can add that into the motion so it's in, in the record, okay. um, which would be helpful down the road when other yes. cases come forward if, if somebody wants to modify the motion or if the motion, the, whoever made the motion wants to modify it. You made the motion. Would you like to modify it to, <laughs> to reflect the reasoning behind the sure. demolition? Motion to allow demolition of the garage at 101 North North First Street uh, in the case that the deterioration of the property goes beyond the uh, reasonable cost of restoration or replacement due to neglect but and that this you know this is being presented this way because the um, how do I want to put it because the condition of the property is beyond the is at, is at a point of no return but should never have really been put in this position because of the neglect involved. Does that make any sense? No. Okay. <laughs> you can you read back what you're gonna, You kind of have to uh, can can that kind of circle a around a little bit. Yeah. You're, um, you're making a motion to allow the demolition mm -hmm. in case that the deterioration of the property goes beyond the reasonable cost of restoration slash replacement due to neglect due to neglect because the condition of the property is at a point of no return can you make it in in uh, probably just uh, stop right there then staff's finding uh he, he said uh, the severity of the deterioration in, is significant including the foundation the wall framing roof framing uh and lack of any architectural features and details 
So that to me says something about the condition. And the, the, our position then is um, we, we're allowing it because of the condition, but we are uh, not accepting that it it couldn't have been saved had it been had we reached some consensus sooner. That we we let, that we I, I would say that we're somewhat complicit with this. I, I don't know how it could have been prevented. This is a preventable. And that could be in the discussion. Yeah, I, th I, th I think if you want to put in the motion that it should be something as simple as you're moving to accept the request as presented with the caveat that the commission believes that, that um, it's demolition by neglect okay. um, and the condition is beyond repair. As simple as that, but that then gives you a reason when you're looking at future cases. And then I think we should bring up the fact of the cost of the renovation. Yeah, it was. So I think, can we go one more time at the motion? <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, uh, okay. Or do you just need you to? Know, well, I was just thinking of Mr. Lambert's. Yes. So you have it as you're making a motion to allow the demolition as presented, and that the commission believes it is a de demolition beyond neglect. Due to neglect. Or, yeah, or demolition due to neglect. And that the cost of replacement or renovation far exceeds reasonable amounts. Okay. Is that okay by the second? Yeah. Is that okay by you? Right. Who, who was second? I second earlier. There was the original motion. Yeah, you second it. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, no, I, I, I still second it. Okay. You want to read through it again? Uh, sure, let's do one more time. Just just yeah, so, so we get it, get it right. Okay. I've got Commissioner Solomon making the motion to allow the demolition as presented and the, that the commission believes it is demolition due to neglect and that the cost of replacement renovation far exceeds reasonable amounts. Seconded by Mr. Stazen. I think that hits it. Okay. Let's All go. right, roll call. Uh, Mr. Hamilton. Yes or no? Aye. Okay. Hiller? Aye. Solomon? Aye. Stazen? Aye. And Zelmer? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Our next item on the agenda is the review of building permit for 307 309 West State Street. Mr. Lambert. This case has been before us uh, twice before. Um, this is a project for a request for a storefront rehabilitation. Uh, it is located at 307 and 309 uh, <coughs> West State Street in the um, Central Geneva Historic District and uh, in the northern half of the uh, local historic district. Just briefly, um, Reviewing the uh, images you've seen before, this is existing conditions as of June of 2018. The storefronts in question are the uh, one to the left that was formerly occupied by Le Doggy Divine and the uh, vacant storefront that was, one, uh, was most recently Fox Jewelers. Um, the building, as you remember, was built as the Kendall Building for George Kendall. It originally was a dual storefront building with a grocery store on one side and a dry goods on the other. It was built in 1909. Um, uh, and built by the Wilson brothers, and this is one of their earliest um, commercial buildings in, in Geneva. Uh, a historic photograph of the building uh, around 1918 that shows the um, addition of the third bay to the uh, storefronts made in 1910. Uh, um, but also to remind you that the uh, storefront at 307 West State Street was remodeled probably within the first two years of its existence. This is a image of that storefront when it was converted to a uh, movie theater sometime between uh, 1911 and 1912. Um, the current conditions are that the um, 309, uh, West 309 West State Street storefront um, has been painted while the um, uh, the original uh, storefront 
uh, parapet on, at 307 West State Street has remained unpainted. It's an original uh, condition. However, the uh, storefront at 307 has been remodeled numerous times during its lifetime, and the storefront at the 309 West State Street uh, survives as an original storefront. Uh, some details of the original storefront. Again, just another overall view. Uh, the existing conditions were documented by uh, their architect. Um, the, pro the proposal in June was to do a centralized entry, which the commission um, did not support during the concept review. Um, they, the applicants then came back with a, um, a floor plan that um, satisfied the building commissioner that there were two exits out of this uh, space. So it proceeded to a permit review on July 17th. Um, with a single entry at the uh, historic 309 West State Street location. Um, the uh, proposed elevation, the proposed rendering. Um, in, uh, at the June and July meetings, the uh, proposal was to close in the historic transom as shown in the uh, architect's drawing. Um, however, the um, Original transoms are still visible at the, two, at the 309 uh, West State Street, and so the request was to um, consider retaining the upper transoms. The proposal is to replace the storefronts with operable windows somewhat uh, like what they have in their existing location, one door uh, to the uh, east. So in your packets, you... Um, you receive shop drawings of the proposed um, window framing system, um, which does show the uh, transoms being retained and shows the operable windows in place of the storefront windows, the fixed storefront windows. Um, the shop drawings indicate that this is an aluminum uh, storefront system uh, that's approximately four and a half inches deep. The existing storefront, at the 1909, is approximately two inches deep uh, to give you some reference of the... Uh, uh, change there. Um, it, it was unclear in the submittal whether this is just being proposed for 307 West State Street or if this is the same system being installed somehow in the 1909 storefront at 309 West State Street. One of the items brought up um, at the last review was that we have historic documentation of what the bulkhead or dado looked like, which was a square paneled uh, system. The uh, submitted drawing still is showing a uh, 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 bulkhead that's just a rectangular panel that doesn't uh, reference the historic details. In your packet, I summarized the SOI standards, how they apply to this case. Um, the standards for preserving the historic storefront, basically uh, standards 2, 5, 6, 9, and 10 um, um, are in conflict with the proposal. Um, again, the, the rendering, again, showing the masonry. Um, showing that they have uh, done some uh, test uh, work on stripping the existing uh, pink paint um, off of the building. Um, and then the uh, original proposal as stated in June was that they were going to be whitewashing the, um, the building and it was described as being a thinner process than uh, normal paints. So it would be uh, just a, uh, uh, basically a, a, a thin coating over the brick. Um, they have provided now um, specifications for the paint system, um, which is uh, a P P uh, PPG coating um, called Permacrete, which is designed for high-rise apartments, condominiums, tilt-up warehouses, uh, precast concrete, things such as that. Um, it does have a much thicker dry film finish than paint. Um, it is a breathable uh, material, um, but the entire system um, as noted here, when you read through the specifications, and, and um, I did speak with the representative of Pittsburgh Paints, uh, the technical rep, um, the proposed coating is two to six and a half times thicker than a traditional paint system. So it is a thicker um, uh, paint. Um, so again, while paint is generally not um, under the purview of the Historic Preservation Commission, this is a part of a proposal for an entire storefront renovation. and. Um, it's um, a gray area, and I have spoken with um, uh, David DeGroote, the Director of Community Development, and, and discussed this conflict between the, um, that paint is not a permitted, is not a, is not a, a, a uh, 
a type of work that requires a permit. However, uh, the SOI standards are adopted and codified in the city code, and it says that historic features should not be um, uh, uh, damaged or otherwise destroyed. Um, in talking with the technical rep, uh, Tristan from Pittsburgh Paints, um, he said this uh, system is, um, it bites into the brick is his exact quote, and to remove it would actually deteriorate the face of the brick. That's his exact uh, description of the product. Um, so with that information, the proposed exterior painting of the historically unpainted masonry violates or is in conflict with uh, SOI standards 2, 5, 6, and 7. Um, and that is all recorded in the uh, staff analysis I provided to you. So with that, um, I will turn the podium over to the applicants. Let me bring it back to the front here. And they can tell you where they're at today and uh, um, answer any of your questions and you can ask them questions. So who's speaking first today? Dave? <clears throat> Backwards and forwards. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. My name is Dave Cilio, uh, owner of Noble House, local Geneva resident. As Michael had mentioned, this is our third time presenting to the board. Um, initially, when we presented, uh, we asked for the center door entry. Um, we conceded to the board and moved it over to the 309 entry. With that having the uh, most historic correctness of the two buildings that we're looking to move uh, into. Um, when we came back in July, uh, you asked for further detail on our technique of how we were going to alter the uh, facade with paint and or the, and the window systems. Um, so we supplied those uh, specs to you. I brought today with us um, Travis, uh, a specialist from PPG, to address any questions you may have. Um, and then Mark Industries was the window system that we're using that uh, we're currently installing in Noble House uh, Glen Ellen. Um, it's very similar to the system that we have in the 305 property. And I think Michael was uh, not sure, not completely aware, but we are, our intentions are to use the same system in both 309 and 305. So uh, y'all had some questions on detail, but I'm hoping that the, the packet and the, the shop drawings and the cut sheets answer any questions that you may have had back in J July. So, <clears throat> Are you changing out the storefront in 307? Yes, sir. Back, I mean, in, our, in a few of the conversations we had in the last two months, um, it seemed as if everyone, with all the alterations that have been to 307 has, over the time. I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 307 I, is a middle building. Okay. I meant so 309. 309, 309 is, we, is the one I meant. The, the one with the original storefront. Not at all. We want to maintain the bulkhead. We are going to maintain the transom. We're maintaining the window dimensions. All we're doing is replacing with an efficient window uh, system. That is to code. So... The transom is maintaining, the bulkhead is staying there. The bulkhead was altered, I believe, back in the 60s or 70s with the marble. Um, some of our architectural detail, we are attempting to bring it back to the original. Michael mentioned that you know, in our, in our drawing, and I apologize for that, that it is cedar planking that is boxed out. It doesn't have the detail that it did back in 1909. I could easily make that happen. But right now it's been, it is not historically accurate because it was altered back in the 60s or 70s whenever marble came into play. Um, I cannot speak if that wood or the glass is original to 1909, but in our proposal to you in, in attempting to get this permit, we're maintaining the dimensions of the windows. And we're going to carry the dimensions of 309 to the east in the 307 building and have it unified across is what our plan is. Um, back in July, you didn't have enough detail. It was out to bid at the time, so I did not have a specific manufacturer. We have committed to Mark Industries as they are, again, doing the property at, in Glen Ellen. Um, but what we are proposing to put in is a working window system similar to the 305 property that we currently operate make it open to the east and the west 
in the in the specific window dimensions that allow to move the static window would maintain in the doorway and the vestibule um, and I believe the center window where the, the center brick decorative brick is uh, right above the car so that would be a static window but the, there will be two windows operating windows in the 307 which is the old Fox Jewelers and there will be two operating windows in the 309 that again would louver to the east or the west depending on the location of, in the property. And will the new storefront of 307 be as it's proposed here, straight and flush? Yes, or sir. Will it, will it have a setback? It'll be straight and flush. The, straight and flush. Because that doorway has been altered when it, was a, when it originally was built, and then it turned into the theater. And then over the years, that door has kind of jumped right. a, couple ply, a couple times. So as my understanding from the advice from the, the commission was that we would be allowed to eliminate that vestibule to improve add additional seating in that area, but maintain the 309 vestibule doorway because that one, that, do, that building has not been altered in the historic data that we've seen looking through the museum photos. <clears throat> did, did I hear you say that you were going to match the windows on 309 or 307 to 309? We are. In size. So, so the drawing is not correct. They are. There's an awning there, but somewhere right, and if you the, go the, to the windows on 307 are actually uh, they're, they're narrower right please if, if, if you actually look at the storefront I think Alex can verify this I think the the east storefronts a foot narrower than the um, west storefront okay. so they are going to be a slightly smaller storefront window the difference I think that you're seeing pronounced is that the proposed um, infill of the original central entry is slightly wider than the um, original recess. If I may go, because there's not a door there anymore. Let's see. If so you notice, when I was doing the review, I highlighted the two dimensions. So if you see where the door is, the original door is, I think it's seven foot something. I can't read it from here. And the proposed infill is eight foot seven or something. So that's what's making the storefront windows on the east side look a little narrower. Um, but again, as uh, Mr. Silly has pointed out, uh, that storefront has been altered numerous times throughout its life. So, um, um, you know, I think the commission needs to decide whether or not the space needs what you're looking for or, or, or what. But, but that, has, that, that storefront has been altered numerous times. So basically 307 is being brought back to what it originally was, mimicking 309. I had to draw a little sheet here because I keep getting them mixed up except without the door right this Correct. dimension is wider than the historic dimension correct but these windows were narrower on this unit than they were on this when you look at the historic Got photographs it. and the dimensions of the units okay. our focus was to maintain the dimensions of the 309 building the pink dog store sure. right so the windows there and the in the the jams and the the transom the bulkhead the height that's not changing all we're doing is replacing the existing windows with that working window system in the current dimensions. And then again, carrying that level because the, the 307 building to the right, I guess, or we're looking at this side, is, has a higher window. If you look at it. So that window in the brown building, the 305 in the middle building, we're maintaining, we're going to bring over the window levels of the 309 and maintain that going across, heading to the east into the Fox Jeweler property. And then under the awning of the Doggy Divine, there is a transom window system there, or, not, or transom windows. We're going to carry that transom across again to the 305 Fox Jewelers. So it'll be uniformed all the way across. And then the one you said that's in the middle looks like there's a red light in the middle there yeah it that's going to be uh that's a static window a static window mm -hmm. it's not the width of it does not the, the two panels that would go in there to make it move left or right it wasn't worth i mean we just we're maintaining that one and again the two vestibule windows and the doorway 
So there'll be one, two, there'll be four operating windows. And where the doorway is on the Fox Jewelers, trying to maintain uniformity, I believe that one is a uh, static window as well. And the pilasters are going to remain? I'm sorry? The pilaster is going to remain? It is, yes. And you said that if, if need be to, to mimic the original uh, bulkheading on the lower level, you would be, have no issue with putting that design into the wood. No, that placement. could easily be accomplished. We just, I could look up that photo that Michael was referring to, and you know, our carpenter could duplicate that very easily. The uh, folding windows that are in 305 mm -hmm. have, are, you know, are quite substantial. I mean, they they're, they're have a good Those frame are a wood. Heavy. We did not install those. Those were there when we took over the property when it was Tavolino, the Italian restaurant. Okay, that so is a wooden uh, window system. Okay. The one that we're provide, uh, giving you uh, specs for is a uh, aluminum clad. And a narrower. Much narrow. Narrower I believe it's an inch and a half as opposed to those are several inches. Right. Yeah, there are quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you double them up. So when you say, and, and that's what's going to happen, you have an inch and a half, so doubled, mostly they'll be doubled or butted up against another window, so you're talking about it. Maybe three inches. Yeah, inch. your, so. your shop drawing actually shows two and an eighth for, this, for the style of the window itself. Two and an eighth for the, okay. for the, for the operable, the, you're talking about the, the operable part of the window, right? Right. That is two and an eighth. That's two and an eighth. Okay. <clears throat> and then doubling that up, it'll be four and a quarter. Okay, which is close to what, what the, the trim on the window is now. I didn't measure it, but I, I, it, it well, yeah. seemed close. Is it two and a half or an inch and a half? I think it's an inch and a half, as I recall. It's labeled as, okay. the, the framing system is two, and, two by four and a half is what it's labeled as. Okay. If that's what it is, then... I thought it was an inch and a half. Sorry, I was off the. No, no, that's a, that, that's not a. No, that makes me feel better. I, I, I thought when you said we were using the same system that was in 305, I thought it was going to be a. Yeah, no, it's, it's a little bit thinner. Okay. M Michael, can you go back to the photo that you were on a minute ago? Uh, that one. So the bulkhead, that's. That's what it's going to look like. We can duplicate that, yes. I mean, is that is that what's there? No. Underneath the marble. I I can't answer that. I don't know what's underneath there. I mean, it was again, it was altered. Um, there is a tenant that was supposed to have left in on July 15th. She's waiting for her construction to be completed. So when she gets out, then I could do some more experimental or investigatory demolition to find out what's below, under, underneath there. Probably. But I doubt it is there. Um, but again, it, what we proposed what provided was a cedar planking. It was just a box cedar planking, which is kind of similar to that with other than there's some vertical decorative stuff there. If you would like that, I could easily make that happen. I mean, it's just carpentry. Sure. You know. But our intention is, in, is to bring it back to as much historically accurate as we can. We're trying to do our whitewash because I think we're all in agreement that no one likes that pink color. Um, and again, from the exper or the test stripping that we've done, that 309 has been painted multiple times. Um, I believe the one, the Fox jeweler is raw brick, but to get the 309 brick to the, I guess the condition of the 305 brick, it would be, very difficult and it does not meet the requirements of, I think it would be sandblasting it. I don't believe, and can you all speak on Travis? Would, would we, sure. would we, Travis is from PPG. Um, he'd be able to speak if we can get it to the condition of the 305. Do we want to stay on the storefront before we go to the coating issue? I think. I th I think we want to talk about the storefront and then talk about coding. I don't think we want to intermingle them right now. Um, I'm sorry, 
But uh, no does, does anyone have any? No, no offense on that. Yeah. I think that's the right way to do it. I think that we want to get a conclusion on the storefront that we're looking at, and then we'll move to the coding. That's fine. Okay. Is there any more comments from the commission about the storefront? I, I think we're on the same page. I mean, we have a nice uh, original storefront in, in uh, 309. And, uh, you know, we, we want to carry the, the, the feel or the character of that over into your 307 building is what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. We just, we don't want it to look like it's cobbled together and we want to try to carry that across. So I think we're on agreement in terms of trying to, uh, what they're, we're trying they're, to accomplish they're demolition. It. They're demoing the storefront from 309. It's gone. I mean, but I, I, I think there's, you know. When you say demo, what do you, what, what is your perception of demo? Or what are you doing? Well, you're replacing you're, you're, the windows? You're taking out the original storefront. I'm not. I'm replacing a window. The storefront, are we on, are we talking about 309? I'm, I'm talking the about the building? Doggy Divine, the pink yes. one. The pink one. Are you taking out the storefront that's in there? You're you're removing it. The the part that's the the at the, the bottom, the marble. No, no, the glass itself. And the, the glass, glass is the framing. All, the framing, all of it is gone. Right. And it's going to be replaced with an aluminum storefront. Gotcha. And it, this aluminum storefront is going to have operable windows within it. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Operable windows. Yep. Yeah. So. But. I, my question, my point is, I think we're, you know, we're trying to keep, maintain the character of the building. Okay. Now, if 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 we're, you know, keeping the door in the same place, we're keeping the the entryway similar. We're doing the pilasters. We're we're, we're working with this storefront as we see it now. We're trying to get some kind of continuity between the original and what was on the right hand, what's going in on the right hand side. And I I, I think that. I think we're reaching some kind of a balance here. I, I don't agree 100 percent. Yes, I, I'd like it to restore it back to original perfectly, but I don't know that we, I don't know if that's a, a fair way to do it either because I think you would end up with you still have to do something to the 307 section. So I, I, I don't know. That, that's just my opinion. I, I think what I, what I'm what, what I see in this proposal is a couple of things. First of all, we're we're bringing continuity back to the two buildings okay. because obviously the Fox Jewelers is not the original setup. Doggy Divine is. We're going to mimic Doggy Divine to where Fox was. Um, and then now I understand why they want the, the windows to open, but they are still going to maintain the fixed windows on either side of the doorway and then the one in the center underneath that brick work there so they're so we're just kind of they're just kind of replacing the two existing large plate glass probably yes windows with a system within that frame work in that same dimension but I'm trying to the, we're the trying whole, to maintain the dimension. We're not altering the, the, the storefront. I, I what we're altering is the window system. But you're removing the whole they're removing the whole storefront to do that. And, and mimicking it with a new yeah, system. Yeah, I, I just want it's I, already been done on the new system. Yeah. It's it's really it's it's three oh nine is the only one that's really in that I'm, looking at because 307 is going to be all different anyway and it's not original and I would agree I, I, I don't have a, I just want it, it's not in and it's all new it's not some of it new some of it old it is mimicking what what was there with, with mimicking fixed and unfixed there. an attempt in an attempt to also make it to code and efficiencies and stuff like that and and, and safety this is not a tempered glass should there be an issue and, and someone lean on that glass? I don't know if that is considered in your, you know, judgment, but there is a liability there with this old glass. And, you know, we're replacing it with a safer, more efficient, something to code. 
that is maintaining the integrity and again the dimensions of the original building. So if, if I heard right, the transom is being replaced? Yes. In 309. Which building? All of them. Right. Both of them. Right. But I was There's only one was existing asking. in Doggy Divine. There is oh, not yeah. a transom in the Fox Jewelers. We're going to carry a transom over, it, mm -hmm. again, keeping that same uniformed window look. Well, I was asking for a clarification from Commissioner Hamilton. I just again to underscore what chairman zelmer is saying and what um, mr teipel has said over here the entire storefront is going away it's just being recreated in in aluminum form so there's nothing left of the wilson brothers storefront they're not just taking out the transom they're taking out the entire storefront and and starting anew with something that mimics the proportions so they're just re replacing it with one that looks like like that yes sir we're not altering the brick we're bringing the bulkhead back to its original picture from 1918 <coughs> um, we're just trying to make it look prettier than it is right now it's two it's gonna be two vacant buildings that we're making a considerable amount of investment in The Day building is about to be vacant. The foot store across the street, the shoe store across the street is vacant. Our intention is not to deteriorate at all anything to the, to the building. We want to maintain its integrity and historic accuracy, but just keeping the character, keeping the character of the building, but bringing it up to code and making it efficient. I guess in July when I left, my opinion was that the storefront in 309 should be maintained. And if there were windows that we wanted to replace, operable windows that could work within that, that we could, we could entertain that. The, the bulkhead, the transom, the, the frame, the columns, the everything but the glass, the, the, the historical storefront was to be kept, refurbished. I think we're attempting to do that. I mean, the columns are not moving. The bulkhead is not moving. We're just putting new glass in there. That is a working window system. I, I think you, you have a concept of it and we have a concept of it and those two concepts are meeting. Uh, our concept is that it's an existing storefront from whenever the building was built and it's a... Can anyone state if that wood or if that glass is from 1909? The dimensions are there the, according to the photography but do we know if that glass is accurate or is 100 years old? Do we know if that wood is 100 years old? No one can answer these questions when I'm, I mean, we're, I, I understand. I'm not trying to, I, I'm not trying but, to knock something down that well, is, Well, I mean, even, you know, even if it were only, if it's, our, our purvey is to maintain the historic district. Yep. And when, and the SOI standards are, if there's an existing system that works, that I shouldn't say works. There's an existing system we need and can be maintained. We should maintain it. Okay. How do I duplicate that? How do you duplicate it? So now I have one building. Nine, the Kendall 1909 is one building. I'm trying to main, turn one, two storefronts into one. And if you don't allow us to alter 309, I don't understand how I'm able to duplicate it in the 307 side I I think you you know I mean that that was it's it's a it's not an easy process but that's what we were looking at and 
what, what you've basically done is I'm going to rip it all out and start from scratch. And that's not what the SOI standards stand for. That, that gives it a false sense of historicism, that that's the way it looked at one time, but it, it is a, it's a difficult thing. I mean, it's not easy. It, it, it's three months, not easy. I understand. I've been paying well, rent. Well, I mean, we've also <laughs> and, and asked, <laughs> we've asked for a lot of, we've asked for a, more detail. We're finally seeing some detail of what you really want to do. Yep. And now we're looking at what you want to do, and I'm not sure that, I, I don't, I can't speak for any of the other commissioners, but I'm not sure that that meets the, what we're doing and meets the SOI standards. 307 has already been altered so that it doesn't look anything like what there was. I agree. We're bringing it back to closer to what it was. You know, we, we need to meet. I, I understand that. I understand and, you know, that. It, it, it's, it's a <laughs> no, you don't understand it. That's the problem. I'm not trying. We're not trying to be contentious at all. Oh, I'm, just, I'm not I, being I, contentious I, and, and, either. And I, I'm, I'm glad to see that we to have to, details. We're of trying what? to get to a, 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 I, a meeting point, I guess. I, I agree. I agree. And when you say that we're, we're ripping it all out, we're just the, the brick facade is the same. I, the bulkheads I, will be the same. Be I, th I, th I believe that I believe that Mr. Hamilton stated it correctly. When we left last time, we were going to look at how we could use the existing storefront mm -hmm. and work with that. Okay. Not the proportions of the existing storefront, but the actual storefront. Is that correct, Mr. Hamilton? Yes. So. The 307, we know, has been changed. Yeah. I, I have no problem with what, what we want to do on the 307 side. My, my focus has been on what is the historic storefront at 309 and trying to renovate as much of that as we possibly can without replacing the windows. I can't prove that the glass is 100 years old. I have no problem replacing the glass for a different kind of window system. I would like it to operate within the framework of the historic storefront. That's it. it what we provide you states that it is maintaining it's within those dimensions. So when the glass is removed, they're just put, they're dropping I, I, I that guess system, I, that's in, the window system in those dimensions. We're looking to maintain the storefront, and you're looking to replicate the storefront. And that's kind of the loggerheads we're at here. Um, if, if I may, uh, the, the, the rough opening dimensions haven't changed on, on 309, but what you have is large panels of fixed glazing that you're replacing with operable windows with, with, with many more uh, buttons or mullions in there than the character now. So the, I, I, would, I would contend that it is similar in terms of maintaining the rough openings and dimensional sizing, but the glazing is not anywhere near what, uh, it, and it, uh, not being at the last meeting, I, I, I think that may be the gist of, of some of this issue. And I get what you're saying. Um, it's just difficult, well, again, we're, we're going, we're trying to get a work, working window system. We, we commonly get compliments on our windows and the f open airness of the, the right, building, the right. property that we're operating now. We're trying to duplicate that over in the new expansion. Um, but with that dimension of glazing those large windows, that obviously you can't move something that large. Well, and, and, and that may be the crust of the issue. Yeah. We have large expanses of glass now and and so uh it, it's probably it's fixed, the difference you cannot it's maintain ridiculous. that opening size and keep them up and make them operable uh, it, it's probably the, one of the biggest issues from my perspective on nine and and you know uh to to maintain symmetry between the seven and nine 
you know, having operable on one side and fig glazing on the other. Yes, from a design perspective, that, that may be a challenge as well. It's a bit awkward, but that yes. This is historic preservation, and I, I, I think these gentlemen's point is to, to that issue itself. Okay. So that's a no then. Is that where we're at? I mean, if I surrender and say it's all going to be fixed glass, what is, I'm trying to not have to come back in a month. I, I, so I agree. I, I, mean, I, want to, I want to start construction. I want to move forward and, and let other people have an opportunity to present. Um, I was hoping the third time was a charm, but. I mean, I, I, you say it's your third time coming here, but this is the, really the, one of the first times we've seen actually what you want to do. That, that's no, you saw it the first time. That w the first time we've changed it now to meet your requests. The second time we had, we didn't have shop drawings. We didn't have, uh, you know. You, you don't we didn't. That. You explained what you wanted to do, and yeah. we didn't. It was really difficult to see exactly what it was. So yeah, I mean, I think well. the fact that it, you're saying it's the third time, but I'm not going to argue. It, there's no reason to argue about this. Sure. I think what we want to do is have some consensus about what what it is we're looking for. Well, we would approve on the on the side of, of the commission. And, you know, what I think what we were what we were looking for, what we came out of last meeting was, is that you would keep the historic storefront and work with it to become, to work in a window that would work with that. Is, do, you, do you agree with that, Mr. Lambert? Yeah, the, the what we talked about last month or what you talked about and we I referenced was very similar to what we did at the Geneva cleaners with the kiosk being installed within an existing window frame to go back and kind of investigate some kind of way to work within the existing wooden frame and get your operable windows in there um, you know it's it's it, it was done at one location here. There's probably a solution to it. I'm, I, I don't know, um, but I think that's what the commission was asking. Leave the wood frame in place, and if you and find a way to incorporate your operating windows behind it, within it, on top of it, garage doors, sliding doors, or operable windows, whatever the system was, but not removing the historic wood framing because again I know you've asked can anybody prove it to be 1909 if you look at the 1909 pictures it's that storefront um, whether it's the wood the other thing is that I think Chairman uh, Zelmer was pointing out is um, the the ordinance does not say, state to it restore to a specific period not to its original year but to a period of years and our period of significance for the historic district is um, 19, 1835 to 1966 so it's those changes that have occurred within that period that is what the commission should be looking at. That's fine. We will investigate and see if there's an option to get an opera window inside of the current word structures and see in four weeks. Uh, you know, and then hopefully we can duplicate that and make it look uniform in the 307 building. Um, or we just scrap it and we go static and it is what it is uh, so how about we move on to paint <laughs> can I ask one other question on the storefront please the um, the bulkhead yep. on the bottom yep can that be kept on 309 because I'm, ass I'm assuming that's can it be kept yeah I've, I've never said we were doing anything to it other than removing the, the marble, which was right. installed in the 60s and 70s. So when we remove that, that decorative wood that was there from 1909 may still be there. If it's not, I could easily duplicate that yeah. with, with our cedar and carpentry. But I don't think it would be there from mm -hmm. Alex chiming in. <laughs> Again, I think what Commissioner. Um, but the, the, the level of that is not moving. We're going to remove the marble and try to restore it to its original uh, look. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, and I think what you might be driving at is that the marble may have been put on the period of significance, but also remember that the design guidelines and the SOI standards allow replication of elements that have photographic documentation. Okay. So um, 
even if the marble was put on in 1952, um, the option would be there based on photographic evidence to replicate something that was there historically that can be photo documented. So they have an option either way. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the paint or the mason, masonry coatings. You, you're proposing to, are you proposing to, what are you proposing to do with the paint? We would like to take the pink latex off, which is currently damaging and, and killing the brick in the mortar. Mm -hmm. um, and then clean it to a standard that will remove the mildew and whatever corrosive element that's on the brick right now. Okay. And then do a whitewashing of both 309 and 307. Okay. That is our original, that was the center. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, that is, you're, that you're is the concept that. of what we're looking to do. I can't speak paint. I have people here that are professionals and we gladly answer whatever questions you may have. Great. Good evening. Uh, this is the first- Can you get your name? Sure, we Travis can, Green you. with PPG Industries. Um, I'm an account development manager here in the Fox River Valley. Um, this is the first that I'd heard uh, of a whitewashing oh. um, this evening. Uh, so I don't know who you talk to in technical Tristan. from 1-800-PPG or something. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm local on site for all of these. Um, this is, you're talking to a paint guy and asking him to make paint not stick. So, uh, that's kind of, uh, kind of a tough, tough thing. So when I saw what I've heard, um, from this is that they wanted to kind of have a grayish white, kind of a silver. So I gave them our best product, uh, which is a per Permacrete, the 4-22, and it's been renovated to the 4-22XI, okay? Um, it's 100% acrylic, masonry paint, high build. Um, so it's a, it's a thick paint, basically. Well, it's, it's kind of relative. You know, when, when you say, man, it's a thick build, um, the width of this is actually three mils mm -hmm. of paint, right? So six mils, where it was showing there, right? Six to ten mils is, is two pieces of paper. So, I mean, it's not like we're putting a quarter of an inch on. Um, now, I didn't know about the whitewash. So that changes, that changes everything. Um, because from what I saw from the rendering, that looked... That doesn't look washed. That looks like a gray, you know, silver paint. So that's what I've given. Um, to whitewash it, we can use any exterior latex that you want. Because um, I didn't know it was going to be whitewashed. When when they when they take off the, you know, they're going to take off the pink. The yeah, that's easy. The, that's easy. Is that a? Uh, how would you suggest they take off the? The pink. pink? Yeah. I used my key. Oh. Right, my car key. Um, it's going to come off. The, the 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 company that's been hired on to do that, which is one of my customers, has got a uh, um, a non-aggressive stripper. Okay. Um, it's uh, so the there's another coat underneath it as well as mold, mildew, dirt, whatever. Right. That's the reason that it can come off so easy, because um, that is also. A relatively thick coat of latex that's on there probably you know I didn't do a dry film gauge on it but probably I'd say Mike uh, 10 mils 8 to 10 right the reason that it's not sticking to the brick is because it's not sticking to the brick <laughs> it's sticking to the mold the mildew the dirt uh, the other coating that's under there which is probably a pre 1978 I'm guessing um, probably lead-based oil paint um, that's on there. Um, so 
PPG's stance on it from a corporate, from a warrantied level is to strip it, which they've, which the company uh, already has some stripper used it on there. Um, that'll come off fine. Um, where we used it was on the uh, kind of the window edge or whatever there, a little bit of the brick on the, on the far west side of 309. Um, didn't get up above because there's still a tenant in 309 to, to do any test patch on, on up above the canopies. Um, but I don't think that there'll be much of a problem there either. Uh, then once it's, once it's stripped, once it, the building's vacant, right, and you can, you know, put the cones out in the yeah. whole bit, right? Um, the stripping will be, be relatively easy. Um, and then that's when the work comes in, doing the prep work. Um, and to, to whitewash it or to gray wash it now, as I've heard, will be relatively easy as well. And we won't go with anything nearly as aggressive as a permacrete. It'd be a watered down exterior latex, literally. Like a 50-50 blend of the exterior paint and water to just give it the kind of the whitewash. So you know, are that, you saying that then you've got a product on there that somewhere down the future it is reversible? Sure, because what, what I would propose, and I've got some data sheets for it. Uh, sorry I didn't get them to you ahead of time to, to look at. I can leave them with you. Um, my proposal, PPG, let me get their official stance on it, right? Because we're a paint company that prides itself on uh, something that sticks, uh, right? So uh, their official stance is to, to remove it, to clean it, to tuck point it, and then to put a clear sealer over the top. That's their official stance. Um, but we, as their official stance, as you might have talked with Tristan, we don't know what's underneath that pink yet and the damage that's been done there or color, color shade variants, whatever. So I don't know if you're going to have a uniform front on there after it's stripped down. I'm not sure. Um, PPG's is stance officially warranty, right? means official. Um, would be to, to remove it, to clean it, tuck point, let it sit for 30 days for the pH, to, you know, the mortar and stuff to, to kind of level out, and then to put a clear sealer on over the top of it, a concrete sealer, which will help it um, from furring. You know, the old, you know, you rub the old brick and it kind of get the chalk dust and a little bit there. So that's their official stance. Um, through my experience with it we've also got a sacrificial clear graffiti coating okay that it's sacrificial it's water-based clear if we put that down and then did a mist coat right of the whitewashing that paint isn't actually going to be sticking to the brick it's going to be sticking to the sacrificial graffiti coating so with then uh, a brick safe graffiti remover down the road 20 years when, when all the guys from Nobel House are retired and living the high life, uh, we could just use the graffiti remover, it's water-based, go in and clean it and you're down to, in, in the Chicago market we flip it, right? Because things are getting tagged in the city. Yeah. Right, so you've got your, your primer, your paint, and then you use that graffiti coating as a top coat. So when somebody hits it with it a spray can, you can just go in, use the graffiti remover. It's sacrificial, so you'll go back down to the paint and you reapply it. By flipping that, you've got the graffiti, so you've got the paint basically resting on the graffiti coating and it's gonna be watered down. So again, first I've heard of it, we could use a, we could use a watered down stain match to the gray whatever they want and you wouldn't even you wouldn't even i mean it's not going to be aggressive on there at all does that does that breathe as a product or does yes it, it does okay yeah wind driven drain rain resistant and stuff as well yeah yeah but it, but if any moisture within the brick that would get in behind the brick would be able to come it's going to be out. able to penetrate out yeah 
Yeah. That's what we're more concerned sure. about. Sure. And that's where we're going to be using a flat paint as well versus anything with a sheen where it, it, you know, the flat paint's more breathable. You get a sheen to it and it's tighter locking, and that's where you get your bubbles and stuff for failure. So, again, sorry that uh, I'm late to the party here with knowing that it's going to be a whitewash. I was trying to give them a coating that was going to last forever and, uh, and be a solid color. So... Um, but it'll it'll get the it'll get the brick to a uniform uh, a roughly uniform color across it depending on what's underneath it correct. Uh, it's going to take differently to this. At my educated guess is that it's going to look different from the three hundred nine to the three hundred seven. Just because how long has the three hundred nine paint been on? Earliest we've documented is 1978, I believe. The pink? No, the pink's only been on since 1999, 2000 something. Yeah, 2000. It's less than 10 years old, probably. Well, it's 2018, so less than 20 years old. So I'm a math. Okay. It's late tonight. That's all right. I'm an English graduate, not a math major either. So yeah, if it's close to 20 years, there's some difference. It's going to be hard to make that unified. Does anyone have any questions of me? Okay. Okay. Uh, Michael, helps. I've got your email and stuff. I'll send you a different data page okay. with the, and I'll also send you, I've got the sacrificial here for you. Okay. If you want to take a look at that. I like your solution that it's reversible. That's, that's a. Yeah. I mean, we just reverse it, right? To yep. the. Put the sacrificial as your prime coat. Mm -hmm. Then I, I just will dodge the dodge the complaints from the noble house when it fails. Yeah. But, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Using that using that same logic though, if you had I'm sorry, uh, using no, you're that good. same same logic, if you have that sacrificial layer in there, the the wash could be a little denser to make a little more uniform uniformity across. Yeah. Right. So it, it's a possible, you're not, it's not a given that it's going to not match. Yeah, but, you know, I just, yeah, I've got, I've got PPG stance and I know it'll work stance, right? From the official <laughs> PPG warranted stance, um, it's, it's to not have any coating other than a clear sealer on there, concrete sealer. That's all that the warranty. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we, it sounds like we're continuing again. Is that correct with the commission? I guess what's open? The open is the, I mean, I do. The operable windows? The operable windows within the storefront, the existing storefront. Do we want to see that? In documentation, I, I, I would say you don't have a choice. If you're not approving what's submitted as a permit set, yes. then the permit set needs to be revised because we are permit driven here. Okay. So you can't approve something that you don't know what has been submitted. That, I would so agree. So you are essentially that. tabling it for another month. So we need a motion to table then. If I was to shelf the working window system, could we be able to move forward and just say we're going static and we're going to continue it across? Or do you need a whole new set of drawings? I don't want to speak for the building commission here, but I w I'm assuming. I'll defer to I you because you. No. seem like you know the most, obviously. <laughs> I don't know about that, no. but thank you. But uh, um, <clears throat> I can't speak for the commission, but I would, th I would think they're going to require the drawings be um, uh, modified. Re modified, but I think what you've got already is I think you've got the existing conditions as part of the drawing set, and you could probably just say the existing conditions are, you know, cross out the new, the new work and just say you're going to retain the existing. Is what I would guess. Um, I don't want to speak for Eric, but I understand. Mr. Nelson. But. Could we... Uh, do a, a motion that would reflect that, but then if it, I, I don't know 
how you do that. That that's a difficult. You 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 end up putting staff in a very difficult position <laughs> yes. if you put it to, subject to those types of things. I'm not trying to put the this, you know the decision or the commission in a bad place, but it puts staff in a difficult position when we don't know exactly what the commission has approved. I, I, so I mean, I guess I, I guess the question before is what I'm hearing is either. Um, uh, Nobel House is saying they would go to a fixed window system, and if you want to accept that on the verbal and make that the motion, then I won't be able to approve anything until I see those come through the building department. If you if you still want to um, uh, continue to see if there's a system to build behind or within or over or whatever the um, historic wood system, so you can still have the trademark operable windows that your customers like, then it would be appropriate to wait till that's resubmitted and bring that back to the um, the commission in September. I preferred if we could, I'll do our research to see if that's an option. Today, I would shelf the window system and say that we're going to keep the static windows carried across the 307 and if on a verbal approval, if you're willing to take my word for that, and then we'll revisit it another day when we know if that's an option. And then get approval on the on the if we're able to paint. For the record, my design team and the people who are actually painting knew that it was going to be gray washed. So PPJ came in and I ambushed him on that one today. So I'll take blame for that. But we were on the same page that we were gray washing it and giving it a rustic look. <clears throat> and the people who are actually going to do the painting. But if we're able to move forward in any consensus, what do you need for me to? You yep. probably want the whole, I mean, the, it, it, is, it is difficult for us to get a motion together based on, you know, I guess salvaging 309 state and then saying 307 state would be, I'm not sure what we would say to that effect. Can I throw one more suggestion? Sure. Here? Last month, a uh, special meeting was requested, but we didn't have a full commission. So, and we knew there were some people who were going to be absent in the month, so we couldn't get a special meeting together. Um, is there a straw poll that do we know that in two weeks or uh, I need at least a certain amount of time to advertise the meeting, but we could have a special meeting to consider this case if we know we can have a quorum. But last month I couldn't guarantee a quorum. If you want to put it off for uh, two weeks so you're not held up an entire month, I, I'm just trying to find another compromise here. I would be gr greatly appreciative if we were able to do that. I know summer is coming to an end, school starts tomorrow. If we yeah, can try to get together in two weeks. I, I, I'm available if uh, is yeah, there, I, I'll make it and then I'll be there George are you available two weeks that would be like tonight yeah that Tuesday. would be that Tuesday the 4th yeah day after Labor Day day after Labor Day, so day, after Labor day. you're all here Labor Day weekend are gonna be back Labor Day Sun Monday yep. yeah yeah what good. about you Al okay you're good I, I can make that if we have at least four people here we could we could organize a special meeting for that. Okay. Well, can I get a motion to table it till a date certain of the September fourth? Motion to table the discussion to revisions to be reviewed on September fourth. Second. Should should and well, I just to be clear on the, on the fourth we're discussing static windows and it's color well I, I, th I think I think what do you what do you need from me on the floor well I think I think I I'll make a straw poll is, is everyone comfortable with the whitewash the gray wash that, that was explained to us I'm, I'm fine with the way it was described I am too. and I guess we would probably want to see documentation we'll probably want to see documentation of I that. can just, get you just just to, just to we can provide that Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's nothing. Uh, I mean, but but that way it would be that you would be showing us, us and the building department exactly what you would be using. Okay. So. I could easily provide that. Yes. Well, uh, you know, re regarding the motion, though, what, would it be appropriate to state to stipulate the intent of, of the redesign? You mentioned fixed glazing. I, I would think that we ought to make specific reference. To what changes we're we're going to review? I, I don't think you need to at this point. I think you've given some options for them to look at. In the next, uh, I'll need it in about seven days to get it turned around. So 
seven, eight days. I'll, I'll get back in touch with that. But I think you can leave it open at this point. You're asking for a specification, some details on the paint, which they said they can provide, but we don't have it tonight. Um, so hopefully it'll be here by September 4th. Um, and um, as far as whatever you work out with the windows, if you decide to go static or find another way to get your operable windows in and keep the wood storefront, that's going to take some time for them to sort out. So I think you need to leave it flexible and just re uh, table it to a date certain and then see what information can be gathered and put back together. Okay. Okay, I still need a second from someone. I'll, I'll second. Okay. Uh, Hamilton? <coughs> Aye. Hiller? Aye. Solomon? Aye. Stazen? Aye. And Zomer? Aye. Passes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, building permit review is 126 West State Street. next case before us is 126 West State Street. This is a proposed window replacement for um, the, the uh, um, building that's adjacent to and occupied in part by Geneva Cleaners. It is in the central historic district that's listed in the National Register of Historic Places and in the northeast corner of the local um, uh, Geneva Historic District. The um, earliest image that I was able to locate um, at the, and that the applicant was able to submit is this view um, of the cor southeast corner of State and Second Streets circa 1908 to 1910. Um, and it shows the building in question there with the red rectangle around it. And you can see that the, um, win the windows on the State Street side were the three windows that are there today and they were one over one configuration according to this postcard image. Um, Again, the applicant has, has supplied um, historic images that were available. Um, so you can see, again, the building um, in circa 1945 before the bank um, uh, burned in 1953. Um, you can see the um, building reconstructed um, after the fire damage. The fire uh, actually um, did significant damage to the um, building in question. So the facade has been uh, uh, rehabbed, but the, but the window openings are, are still remain. You can see in all these pictures that windows were, excuse me, were one over ones. And then the far right picture is an image um, taken last year, um, again, showing the building um, uh, in, in its present state. The uh, renovation of the b facade was approved by the Historic Preservation Commission in 1989. Um, that included replacement of the windows and um, uh, put in this uh, EFIS system or the exterior insulation finish system on the, over the brick. Um, the windows at that time that were approved instead of the one over ones were a multi-light window. I think it was a six or a nine over nine um, uh, window arrangement. But again, historic pictures show that it was a one over one. The uh, windows that are also under consideration are those windows on the um, uh, the uh, east side of the building, which are visible from uh, both State and First Street. The uh, detail images there show the date stamp of 1989, which coincides with the application for the uh, work that was approved. And uh, these color images are the images that were in black and white in your packet, um, but it can show, does show the extent of the uh, water damage and, and uh, uh, sun damage over time on the 1989 windows. Um, so the b images on the left are windows from the east side of the building showing the, um, both the sill as well as the bottom rail um, being severely deteriorated. And the uh, images on the right are showing the sills facing the north, um, showing significant rot and deterioration of the, of the sills themselves. The windows that are being proposed are a clad weather shield window one over one. Um, looking at the window details, you'll note that the, um, in the elevations on the left, that the proportions are similar to a historic window with a, um, a narrow style or side um, piece of the sash, um, a slightly wider um, top rail, and then a heavier um, bottom rail, which would be consistent with a late 19th century um, window. So 
So with that, I would turn the uh, discussion over to the applicants. Um, we have Mr. Eric Severson from uh, Geneva Cleaners, as well as Patrick McCann from McCann Window and Door to uh, uh, talk about this replacement. So, Eric. That will take you backwards, it'll take you forward. Okay, to great, thank you. Good evening, my name is Eric Severson from Geneva Cleaners. Uh, you recently saw me here with the kiosk project that we right. just finished, and uh, as we got done with that, it was time to move on to uh, the second story windows. Kiosk uh, turned out nice, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, it did. Thank you. Um, I think the pictures pretty much tell the story. Um, are there any questions that I could help field? The windows on the east side are, it, it's hard to tell. Are they one over one also, or are they? And is that, do we have any historic photos of that side that would show any different? I, there are no historic photos that I could find, but there was a building there at one time, so I am suspicious that after the uh, fires in 1950 that perhaps those windows were installed at that point. But there was a building, there were buildings adjacent to that where the one-story building stands now. Uh, from the street, you have... Uh, external uh, uh, storms uh, are they metal storms on the windows now yeah uh, you can't see the windows I mean, it's, uh, the, the front facade has two storms in place one we kept as long as we could but uh, mother nature i just couldn't keep away from those windows that so if you put these new windows up there you won't need the storms i won't need the storms yeah so you'll, it'll actually have a better look mm -hmm. right now the, the storms they just don't quite make it you know? no it's unfortunate that these windows only lasted as long as they did. But that, that's a good argument for old growth windows. Um, no, I, I think I, I think it's a fair replacement. I, you know, it, it's it's gonna have, it's gonna maintain the look, get rid of the storm windows, actually look better. Uh, your maintenance issues are done. Yeah. I think from the street level, I don't I don't have a problem since uh, with a, a window that's clad. On that, since it's not a historic window that we're replacing. I mean, I'm, my preference always is to use original material, but I, I don't see it where it's really going to make a huge difference in this case. I didn't say in the presentation, by the way, this is the second generation of windows since the fire in 1953. Um, they were replaced in 1953 and then replaced again in 1989. Um, so um, there isn't, there are no original parts of the windows because the windows were actually blown out in the fire. Um, the, uh, the other thing I did not mention also is in the submittals there was no color and this is a semi-permanent or permanent material so you may want to be interested in what the color of the cladding is going to be um, just to make sure it's not uh, chartreuse or lemon yellow or something. <laughs> Would, uh, uh, in the original I noticed you have a little bit of an arch in there. Would the original windows have had that arched top sash? Yeah and I, just, and I, I could be wrong too but um, I think uh, Michael, how you have that boxed out, it's actually the building to the right with the eyebrows over. The original bank was the corner building and the one next to it. So um, I had that first, and that's why I thought, but then uh, when we were looking at the History Museum it, and we're counting buildings, yeah, um, it, so it, it, you, you, that's why I thought of first with the arched windows there, that, that, that was the, the, the first Flemish gable. Um, this would be the earlier picture of the bank, and then Yep, you know, I'm not right. sure what you call that roof line. That yep. oh yeah, you're right. I think that, you look down. at the look. Go to the next. Make me look bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I study these darn things all the time just because ah. I I, I kind of like them. But um, yeah, that eyebrow, um, of course, is still there, and there's a top arch, and uh, Patrick McCann will talk to you about <coughs> how that arch, of course, will stay there. Right. The window will just. But I, I think in the original window, I'm, I'm thinking of. The sash may have followed that shape. They did it two ways. They had the curved upper sash, or they also had an infill curved okay. uh, wood infill. So they did I mean, it both ways in that I'm period. Just curious at this right. point. Um, we have samples of the color today. We want to really match uh, that tan facade as the windows are painted today. So we have a color swatch of the cladding. It's a light um, tan that most closely resembles the. Um, light tan of the building and we have a color sample today and Patrick McCann will talk about the windows and the specifications sure. if you're if you'd like some of that detail as well sure 
Bring them we'll on. like to see the color at least. Mm -hmm. This is the first color. Can you state your name? Patrick McCann with Thank McCann Window and Door. This is a fiberglass clad window then? Is it's it wood to the interior, aluminum clad to the exterior. Aluminum clad, okay. Yes. Cameo? Yes. You can keep that if you want. So uh, definitely a wider profile than, or, or than what's up there now. The bottom rail, the check rail at the center and the side style on the product proposed, I measured those windows, it's all within an eighth of an inch. Oh, oh so it's going to be the same, basically. It's, yeah, I think the distance is doing it a, mm -hmm. an injustice. Um, but yeah, we did measure them and they're all within an eighth of an inch. With, with, with this lighting, that this is almost completely irrelevant. Exactly. You got warm <laughs> white fluorescent. Yeah. So uh, it, it'll, it'll be similar to that, but uh, yeah, that's good. Any other comments? I'm good. Thank you. Um, I don't have a problem with it. I think it's fine because we're replacing windows that have been replaced two other times. So, and it seems like it's going to work for what we need. So. Third time's the charm. Jay, can I get a motion? I'll move to uh, uh, accept the uh, proposal as uh, for 130 West State Street as presented. I'll second. Okay. Hamilton. Aye. Hiller. Aye. Salomon. Aye. Stazen. Aye. Selmer. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next one is one two sixteen James Street. Thank you, Chairman Zelmer. 216 James Street is coming to you as some proposed uh, site improvements. Uh, this, this property is located in the Central Geneva Historic District listed in the National Register of Historic Places and is about in the absolute center of the local Geneva Historic District. Uh, the project's coming to you because um, the building is being renovated for a, uh, a new occupant, Harvey's Tales, which is a bookstore and they are proposing to make extensive landscape improvements uh, to the, um, uh, the, the street yard uh, of the building. The proposal is to um, include and relay um, and, and reincorporate the existing pavers and then add additional uh, clay pavers um, to increase the, uh, um, the, the paved area and then add intensive landscaping uh, to the front of the building to make it um, inviting to the public. The proposal also includes See it on the uh, very well on this image, but it all, whoops, wrong one. It also includes fencing at this corner, and also fencing at this corner. The information that was supplied in the packet states that uh, this fence here is identified as a 54-inch high fence. Just before the meeting, um, I spoke with the applicants, and the fences are going to be reduced to um, uh, around 30 to 36 inches in height to be more compatible with the residential character. So um, the references to the 54-inch high fence are not uh, uh, relevant at this point. Um, some examples, this is showing the existing conditions with the existing landscape and the pavement that's going to be relayed and reused with the addition of the proposed brick paver um, as an accent around the existing uh, pavers. And I'll let them describe that a little bit more. Um, and this is the proposed fencing with some concepts of what the uh, site lighting and the overall character of the uh, street yard is intended to be. With that, I would turn over the, um, the podium to Todd Salen from uh, Planscape, um, who is here representing the company, uh, Jim uh, Haugen, who we, I've been working with, is not here this evening, and the owner of Harvey's Tail, uh, Roxanne Osborne. So. This will take you back to the image, this will take you forward. All right, thank you. Todd Salen, Planscape. 
Um, as you mentioned, the, uh, it's a small frontage. We're trying to uh, make an interactive um, courtyard, um, grab a book, get out there, read, ride your bike, park it. Um, just a lot of low perennials uh, to give you a cozy feel in there, add some interest to the uh, streetscape. We've got a, a few trees that will be going in there, but uh, manageable. Um, incorporating the old with the new, the uh, clay paver is the same manufacturer that uh, is used, uh, it's Pine Hall, which is used throughout Geneva on 3rd Street at the intersections and, and throughout the city. Um, be very durable. We're going more of the brown and red tones in this uh, setting here. Um, any questions I can answer at this point? Uh, to the east, now there's a, there's a driveway in there or a, a, an entrance? Does that, the, the uh, fence goes right up to the drive? Is that where it? Correct, yeah. I mean, okay. Do you want to talk about the drive going away? Okay. Is the drive going away? The drive is going away. So the <laughs> fence is going to go, and the landscaping is going to go up to right now, kind of where you see that apron that comes in. Sure. It's going to come, uh, the, our extended patio is going to go right to the point of where the apron ends okay. and the driveway begins. So that driveway is being eliminated. Oh, okay. Are you losing parking in there then? Technically, there was never legal parking there. Okay. So we found that out as we bought the property. So um, we were excited about expanding the patio and creating public space. And you don't so, have to give back to the city for parking. That that's right. Was right. I'd be happy to, but at least uh, <laughs> this worked out. This worked out great for us. So we're very happy with well, that's it. That's good. Actually, there will be four new parking spaces put in across that apron, and that apron. is coming out of the parking fund. Yeah. Um, so there will be actually more public parking, and the non-legal, non-conforming uh, employee parking has gone away. So does the property line go be, go into that drive? Is that where? Yeah, so it's the, that it's funny that line is our property line where it comes straight down to the south and then kind of jogs back at an angle uh, to the northwest. So that is our property line. There's a public utility easement um, that they're working around and within, and that's, that's what that's creates that, that, okay. that line. I've got a question. How do you access that dumpster? Is that on your property? Yes, and that is also being worked out through with the city and through the Public Works Department that in order for them to maintain access to their transformer, which is at the south uh, corner of our building there, uh, yeah, right about there, um, they're going to extend the drive. I, I, don't, I don't know if this is all final, but the, the plans I've seen is they're going to extend the drive from that lot that is south of our property up to that transformer. And then they are going to extend it. My guess is I'm participating in that cost. I haven't heard that yet, but they're <laughs> going to extend that to our dumpster so that the dumpster truck, the, the pickup truck comes straight up that drive and then we'll pick up our dumpster. So that'll require some kind of permanent easement then to access that dumpster. And there is an easement there now. So the easement currently exists on the property. Oh, I was out there today. I, 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 I had trouble locating. <laughs> But, How uh, they were going to get to the dumpster? You figured it out. Yeah. I'll take your with, word. With you're you're not work. alone. It's been a it's been a, it's been a, a <laughs> little bit of a negotiation and a, and a uh, fact searching um, on the city's and the owners' part, but it's being sorted out with planning and public works. Is that a that's not is that fence existing or is that no? New? It'll be a fence around the dumpster so that it isn't. You know, you're not looking at a dumpster when yeah, you're sitting out in the patio. Right. But it's a different type of fence than the yeah, fence it's, that... It's, it's, it's going to be a composite. Okay. Do we have... Con do we have to... Technically, it's visible from the public right-of-way, um, so it would be under review, but uh, again, um, we also... Uh, um, it's not on a pu it's not front of public right-of-way, and so in many instances, we would consider that a rear yard because it's behind the major... Um, the major side. break, yeah. So, I mean, if you want to see it come back or if you want to give no, staff no, I don't, I don't, I, it just, it's, it's a higher fence too, right? That yeah, one's going to stay higher. higher. Yeah. 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 That's the, so in the drawing, the, the, the dark areas are all the planter, the plantings. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. And, and then you have existing pavers are basically where now? They're going to, they're in, um, <coughs> those squared off areas, the, the lines, um, Got it. Push the red button. The red button. 
that one? Break everything on me. Yeah, <laughs> red button. Yeah, the red, you, you, red this button. little digit's got to fit there on there, go. huh? This is going to be existing pavers here, and then in these areas here. All the remaining areas is going to be the clay paver. It's going to border that. So you've got three areas that are going to be the existing uh, slab tile um, pavers that we had in the previous picture. <coughs> the one on the left there. It's basically a Unilock uh, product that we're reusing. I think it will be too. Yeah. Any other questions from the commission? And if I'm reading this right, the fence is just on the two corners. Correct. Is that right? It's going to be open in the center. Open in the middle. And that'll be 30 to 36 inches high. Yeah, we, yeah, we actually looked at it today, actually, and said we want people to come in. We don't want to keep them away. Sure. So uh, <laughs> a little lower to the ground. Just to find the area. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I, anybody have any issues? No. Does it? Uh, it go. It, I, I know that when they moved that building, there was some issues about access for the fire department to get in that alley between uh, what used to be the provincial house in there. Is that with this fence? Is that creating an issue? My understanding, and I have not been in all those conversations, but with the parking lot now that is coming off of uh, Campbell Street, that the fire department and the public works are all satisfied they can access the, um, the transformer and access the buildings in the case of emergency. That's been going back and forth for several months yes. um, in discussions. The sprinkler, in the, to be able to access the sprinkler connections, they've approved that the way that it's laid out, they're, they're satisfied not our purview but I, I just yeah. you know I, I know that it was an issue when they moved the house that there had to be access in there so just... if you're going to make a motion or when you make a motion if you would identify this the, the um, fence height will not exceed 32 in, or 42 inches or something like that um, that'd be appreciated just because it does differ from what's been on this what's on the submittal well, I, I think if um, I think it's pretty good except for that portion I, I don't see any issues with it and it no. doesn't seem like anyone is has any I think it's a nice solution and I think it'll be a, a, a good addition to the downtown can I get a motion from someone? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the request for 216 James Street the exterior improvements as presented with the one addition that the fence along James be limited to a maximum of 42 inches. Second. Okay, okay. Hamilton? Aye. Hiller? Aye. Uh, Solomon? Aye. Stazen? Aye. And Selmer? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had to wait through that whole meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Is it been, you know, informational? It was good. Oh, it's good. Wow. Okay. Yeah, thanks. The next. The next is a secretary's report. Mr. Lambert. The first item I'd like to bring back to you is at the uh, July meeting, you requested that uh, Terry Debates, uh, who's doing the 107 West State Street Barbershop, bring a brick sample back for um, review. You, had, you approved the case, so I didn't put it as an agenda item. Uh, she's now submitted her brick sample, which I'll pass around. Um, I, in talking with her, it sounds like she, this looks like a blend. I don't think she's looking at the blend. I think she's looking at the base um, brick color. Um, so I, the, the dark sooty brick I don't think is being intended. Was that just along the bottom of the building? It would be the two piers on the outside where that are covered with marble now. Um, and then she's hoping to do it under the, um, the 1950s windows, but it all depends on what that substrate is. It's not, that's a right. Blend, it wasn't going to know until they ripped it all off. General Correct. Sale. General sale.
and this closely uh, does this closely match what is on there now we have no idea what the original face brick was because they took that off to put the marble on so I think what your request was was to see something to make sure it was a sympathetic to the period of the building um, which that is very similar to some other brick around the downtown area of that era I thought she was able to take some of it off she was able to take the marble off, but it's the common brick behind that's all that's all that's left it's the common brick so this is an actual <coughs> face brick that's phrase face brick not common brick it's a face brick mm-hmm it's a sanded face brick. So it's fired then? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. And it's, uh, that's a little building that's over next to the uh, okay. little owl. Correct. Next to, between Flagstone and White Lotus uh, um, Hold it there, Tom. therapy. So I, I just need to get either an acclamation, a voice acclamation that that's acceptable so that I can uh, uh, re send that back to her. Or if you have con concerns, I need to send that back to her as well. I have no concerns anyone else. I'm fine. Okay. 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 Um, the next item I have for you is that um, uh, just we're trying to be vigilant, and uh, this morning we did uh, notify a builder who's building a building in the historic district that the windows that were installed were not per the HPC approvals. So we do try to watch everything, but I do appreciate those people who call me every now and then and say, hey, have you looked at this project or that project? Because I try to get out in the historic district fairly frequently. We're working to resolve that issue. The windows were put in with uh, um, uh, d dividers between the glass instead of the uh, interior and exterior simulated divide lights that were specified for the project. Um, so again, if any of you see a project that looks like it may not be um, um, maybe what you thought we had approved, um, I, I appreciate those phone calls. Um, just to update you also, the survey is continuing to make progress. Um, um, I have, um, what I'm working on at this point in the survey, the architectural survey is, uh, um, I get a fairly frequent call, um, why, people want to know why their building is excuse me, identified as significant or contributing in the uh, survey. And in 1999, it was strictly an architectural reconnaissance survey. They drove around and said, that looks like it might be important, that looks like it might be important. Um, what we're doing now is I'm actually spending um, every Thursday at the Geneva History Museum going through their archives and uh, documenting the history on the uh, properties that are identified as significant or contributing, or non-contributing ones that we know were excluded because of age. Um, that work is progressing. It's going uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and it's saving me time on doing that research on my own. So um, we're still shooting to have that project finished within the uh, fiscal year and having that adopted by the city council as our new standard instead of the 1999 architectural survey. Um, the, the last thing I just wanted to point out that um, um, I, I can't plug a business, um, but there is a new window showroom that has opened up in the downtown area. Um, and if any of you are ever questioning what is available out in contemporary windows, it's a very thorough showroom as far as showing what different applied muttons look like, what, what uh, the spacer bars look like, all those things that we talk about here frequently that we don't always get samples. Um, um, so I know you might not be shopping for, for windows, but if you're questioning what something means in a staff report or what it actually lo could look like, um, there is a good physical resource now right within close distance. So I'll let you find where, the, where the, that business is. But, um, um, I, I know sometimes there's questions of what things look like. Um, outside of that, I, um, I'm keeping up with uh, application, building applications. They're still coming at a fairly good pace. They're not as strong as they are in the spring, but they are still coming through. So um, um, that's kind of what my, my weeks are entailing besides working with uh, applicants and potential applicants. Excuse me. Um, are there any questions or comments regarding what I'm doing or what I'm doing on behalf of the commission? What are you doing? I just told you what I'm doing. <laughs> One question, question, Michael. The project we looked at, gosh, probably close to a year ago, at 5th and Ford, where they were doing a pretty major expansion. They wanted to take the garage down. And is, Has there been any update on that one? Uh, yes, I'm meeting actually with them on Friday. Um, I suspect that uh, there will be a public hearing scheduled on that uh, in the near future, but I will know more on Friday. It's one of the other garages. 
Thank you. I have forward to it. a question too, or something. Uh, uh, I was reading this, uh, and I wondered if this could possibly be another option for us when we come up against some of these demolitions. It was a, a thing that they uh, um, do, were doing in Port Portland, where they uh, they would uh, they're in the historic district. Anything that's pre 1913 that's coming down, they require deconstruction rather than demolition. And uh, I, I don't think that Geneva could. You know, support a whole program like that, but it would be nice if that was an option for us. I believe that's called the SANE program, um, S A N E. Well, but um, ba yeah, basically dismantle so that the, the, the materials could be recycled and reused. I, I you know, last week, uh, the, the house kitty corner from the, the garage we just uh, we just allowed to be demolished. They put a, a couple of doors and some columns out at the curb, and, and I looked at that and I thought, now that's an 1850s house. And I actually stopped and looked at the door. I didn't need it, but it was a beautiful, you know, six-panel door. And uh, it, within an hour, it was gone. I mean, people, you know, so, I mean, if people see that the, the, some of this stuff could be available, windows, doors, uh, you know, simple, you know, some of the siding and things like that, I mean, I'm sure there's a, a desire or demand for it. Why I'm somewhat smiling about that is because our former intern who is relocated to Portland, Oregon, sent me the article in the program details about... Uh, about 45 days ago and said, couldn't Geneva uh, implement this somehow? And I haven't pursued it yet at this point, but what the program really is is very interesting because not only they dismantle it, but there's a separation of, of dumpsters. Um, what absolutely has to go to a landfill, what can go to a recycling center, and then what can be salvaged. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, program. Um, I, I ha haven't pursued it yet because I have a lot on my plate, but um, he, uh, Nick, who presented here at least once or twice and was here, he, uh, Nick Westendorf, he uh, actually sent that whole program to me about about 45 days ago. Okay. So I, I thought that was interesting you brought it's, that up. It just, uh, it seems like such a good idea. I mean, even if we could just ask the guy, you know, you don't, if you're going to tear this down, would you just take the windows and the doors and put them at the curb for a week? Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's going to take them. You know, I mean, at least, at least it's recycled. It's not going to go in the landfill. I would be very, I'm very surprised that, uh, Again, going back to the first case tonight, the garage doors actually have survived in pretty good condition on that garage. With the craze for the barn door movement and that look, I wouldn't be surprised if he salvaged those and put them on the curb. Somebody didn't pick those up and they got integrated into a, a project pretty quickly. Um, they're about the most solid thing on that building right now. But uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that that's a good use of repurposing and, and what have you that you're getting to. And it's, again, the idea is not only to salvage and save Parts of old buildings, be careful that it's not false historicism, because again, we have this whole SOI standard about not just applying pieces randomly on buildings, um, but it's also a very environmentally responsible approach to demolition. So is that, does that, that have to be something that eventually gets put in the ordinance? Um, it would, the process would be that I would, I would take it through my department and see if, um, the city council gave that as a um, project that we should be pursuing. So it'd be up to the city council if that's a policy they want to make. And then, depending how they did it, uh, whether it only applied to the historic district or they wanted to apply it to all demolition, because in Portland it's all demolition, whether it's the historic district or not, um, my understanding of it at least. Uh, um, so it would be a policy decision of the city council as to whether or not um, that was made a priority for, for me to pursue on your behalf. Any other questions for me? Any announcements from the public? <laughs> Hello, public. <laughs> no. I, okay. I, mean, I love this idea of repurposing. Yeah. Um, the challenge that went up very close to where I live, I was encouraging them to save some of the stone wall. Sheds. Thank you, sheds. <laughs> Very tough word there. Um, but also, um, landscaping that can be, um, you know, there's just so many things that we can do that sometimes the developer comes in and wipes it out. And we need to like that idea a lot and think about that in a more serious way. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anything
Anything else? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. Second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion passes. Thank you.